Have you ever wondered what kind of stories a building can tell? We're surrounded by buildings, many of them easily recognizable at first glance, like a house or a church. Or perhaps an old stone building that seems to have a charm you just can't escape. A building begging to tell the many stories that live there. Enter Stora College, one of the first historically black colleges in the United States. The old alluring building we see standing today in the heart of Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. It was a school founded in 1867 during a pivotal time. Stora College was part of the solution to the problem of slavery of this lack of education that slavery created. And the idea is not just to teach people how to read and write. That happened right at the beginning, but really it was transformed into teaching people not only how to read and write, but how to teach others how to read and write. And that is the key, right? You can create a learning virus, sending forth the formerly enslaved into the South, and those folks then become the, the first line of destroying the, the vestiges of slavery that are still in place there. After all, it's always been said that education is not the filling of a pot, but the lighting of a fire. So just how did the school come into existence? In order to understand the importance and relevance of such a founding, we need to travel even further back into time before the Civil War. In 1859, Harpers Ferry was the home of the U.S. National Armory and was located strategically at the confluence of the Potomac and Shenandoah Rivers, roughly 40 miles from the capital, Washington, D.C. It was there that John Brown, a white abolitionist, led a small army of former slaves and freeborn blacks in an assault on Harpers Ferry. His primary mission in this was to seize the armory and arm each man with a weapon in what he hoped would be a slave uprising. Unfortunately, this would not work out the way he intended and it ultimately led to the capture, trial, and execution of John Brown. However, his actions would prove to not be in vain. This would be one spark to ignite the Civil War and inspire future leaders to act in the most courageous of ways. You could say that Harper's Ferry seemed destined to become a fundament of principle and hope for Blacks in America. Even Frederick Douglass referred to Storer College and Harper's Ferry as a national icon for Black Americans in the town where the end of American slavery began. So remember those stories living inside these buildings? Storer College has quite a few of them. Some we know and some we'll never be lucky enough to know. But one story we'll share today is about a resilient and resolute woman by the name of Pearl Tatton. Pearl Tatton is one of my favorite historical characters, right? Like one of my biggest heroes in history. Pearl was born in October of 1886. She was born in Connecticut. Ms. Tatton becomes a teacher at, uh, at Stora College. She's the choir teacher. She teaches music. She also made a little bit of side money uh, teaching local um, kids how to play piano. In October of 1931, the United Daughters of the Confederacy organized an event to be held at Storer to dedicate a monument of Hayward Shepherd, coined the Faithful Slave, and Pearl's choir was invited to perform. What tips Pearl Tatton off is an article in the Baltimore Afro-American. The Daughters of the Confederacy for a decade have been looking for a loyal slave. They've been looking for one instance of a black person who was very loyal to the, the Confederacy. And over a decade of research, they find basically nothing. They pervert this story and they subvert this story and they create a white supremacy narrative out of this story. The nature of the monument's not obvious at first. That's the monument that Pearl Tatton and her choir are invited to dedicate. And that is the thing she figures out when she's flipping through the paper and goes, oh, we are a prop, right? We are, we are, being repurposed just like Hayward Shepard was being repurposed to go, race relations are fine in America, 1931 is okay. So she goes to President McDonald and presents him with a note and the clipping from the newspaper. And the note is just amazing. Pearl walks in and hands him this note. And the note says, after reading this article, I wonder if we should have a part in the exercises. 
When I talked with you, I did not see the attitude of the UDC. Do you think we should appear on such a program when we honor John Brown and feel that while he may have used the wrong methods, his motive was just? I feel now that should we take part, we would be most inconsistent. He's not going to make a big stink out of this, but he is going to go, we need to follow through with this. So the event is... It is a potpourri of classic lost cause narrative, right? There are speeches given. It goes on for pages and pages, just defining how slavery was a was a positive for society, how it was a positive for Black folks, right? Like, uh, and then talks about how Hayward Shepard was a patriot type of thing. Everything that you can think of is there in terms of this warped Southern memory. You go on from that speech, and the uh, president of the United Daughters of the Confederacy stands up, uh, Elizabeth Bashinsky. Mrs. Bashinsky goes, oh, oh, you know, my black mammy, I loved my black mammy, and she loved me, right? Like, and, and I'm not, I'm basically quoting here. I, I don't know the quote off the top of my head, but it's basically that. Pearl hears this and just is floored. Now, it's not even true. Like, Mrs. Bashinsky wasn't born until 1867. <laughs> Right, same year that Stora College was created. She didn't even witness slavery, and yet she's singing its praises. Then she she has this, this flooring comment of, um, is it any wonder that the black men and women of the South, those black mammies, would not rise up and join John Brown? Right, like, oh, they loved us. They loved us white folks so much. They're not gonna rise up against us white folks. The crowd couldn't have been more thrilled at Elizabeth's words. They cheered her on with a roaring applause, everyone but Pearl and her choir. As they stood, ready to perform, Pearl took this opportunity to add her own remarks. They're supposed to sing, and she goes up to the microphone. And it's that courage of walking up to the microphone to me that is fascinating. And I stop myself and say, would I have that courage? If the deck is stacked against me so hard, do I have the courage to walk up to that microphone and speak power and speak truth. She opens up the, the, the little kind of impromptu speech she says with, um, I am the daughter of a Connecticut Yankee uh, who wore that blue uniform and who fought against the South. Charles Tatton joined the 29th Connecticut and he fought through the war, like dad did this. But then she says, we at Storer College are trying to educate these young people right here behind me, right? Like these young folks and, and help lift them up and so that they can overcome the legacy of the Black Mammy. And there she underscores it, right? Like she points right to what's stuck in her craw in that speech. And she goes, that's the point. That's when I decided to stand up. And then she turns on her heels and strikes up the choir and they sing a Negro spiritual. And it's a song called Standing in the Need of Prayer. If we look back at the time this occurred, strong in the midst of the Jim Crow era, we can see what a significant feat Pearl's response was. It was during this very time that Blacks could be hanged for merely looking at a white person or showing any amount of perceived indecency or disrespect. What Pearl did defied the definition of courageous. She knew she was driving a knife in the side there. She set out spoiling for a fight, and that fight started when Dr. McDonald said, no, we're still going. Midway through the program, someone in the audience writes a note. It gets passed up to Pearl. And she shared it with the Baltimore Afro-American. That's how we know this exists. Is that she shared the note with them. They published it on the front page. And said how impertinent your words were, how they ruined the whole day. She becomes a hero on the front pages of the Baltimore Afro-American. But one of the questions that starts getting asked is, who put her in this position to begin with? And that's President McDonald. There are alumni that start writing letters to the Baltimore Afro-American going, I am so glad she stood up. Why'd she have to stand up? Why was she put in this position? Why was this even a question? I'm never giving a dime to that institution again. We see Stora College standing today, and it's a building that some people may not give a second thought to. Maybe some will stop and read the historical facts about the school and its students. But a few will see it as more than just a building. They'll see it for what it truly is, a symbol of freedom that gave so many Blacks something to live for. It was an institution of hope and dreams that came alive 
so much that it should still give us hope that we need today. So oh. 